15th, and I want to welcome everyone to the 2020 Hurricane Seasonal Outlook presented by the National Weather Service in Wilmington, North Carolina. Uh, there are three of us on the call today, uh, myself, uh, also Mike Kochasek, one of our uh, senior forecasters, and also Steve Paff, our warning coordination meteorologist. And we'll all be taking a portion of today's broadcast to discuss uh, some items of interest for uh, this 2020 Seasonal Outlook. So a little overview of what we're going to discuss today. We'll start off looking at seasonal forecast factors. In other words, uh, what uh, are the factors that are going to make the 2020 hurricane season the active season we believe it's going to be? Uh, we'll also look at considerations for individual storms, uh, what directions, what uh, of motion, what speeds, what different uh, impacts can hurricanes bring as they approach the coast of uh, South and North Carolina. We'll look at uh, changes for the hurricane season, how we as the weather service present uh, the forecast and the, and the threats to you, how that's changing for 2020. We'll also review some of the public messaging challenges that hurricanes present, and also show some of the resources and decision tools that are available to all of us, uh, both in the office and also uh, uh, out in the field. So we'll go ahead and get started here with just a very brief one slide overview of the 2019 season. Of course, it was a very active season with 18 named storms, six of those uh, strengthened to hurricane strength and three became major hurricanes. That's category three or stronger with uh, winds of 115 miles an hour or greater. Uh, this was a deadly season, unfortunately, with over 116 fatalities, $12 billion damage. Of course, most of that occurring uh, during uh, absolutely horrible Hurricane Dorian as it stalled across the northern Bahamas as a Category 5 and uh, did just immense damage down there. This, of course, 2019 was the fourth consecutive year of above normal uh, hurricane activity. The normals in terms of long-term averages that we look at are 12 hurricanes, I'm sorry, 12 tropical storms, six hurricanes, and three major hurricanes. And of course, the 2019 season was, was above normal, uh, particularly in the tropical storm category there. Now, I want to uh, just review real quickly, which storm do you believe caused the most fatalities along the U.S. East Coast? And the easy answer you would think might be Hurricane Dorian, of course, a major hurricane moving very, very close to Florida, Georgia, and the Carolinas, uh, did a lot of damage in the Bahamas. But in terms of impact on the United States, even though it made landfall in Carteret and Dare counties in extreme eastern North Carolina, did not cause a particular loss of life in the United States. The most deadly storm was actually this guy way out here in the Atlantic. This was uh, Hurricane Lorenzo, a major hurricane. It never came within even 2,000 miles of the U.S. East Coast. However, the long period swells from this storm, being such a major storm and focusing that swell toward the East Coast for so many days caused a large number of rip current fatalities uh, here in the Carolinas specifically, but even in other states as well. So that's one of the... Uh, uh, messaging challenges we have is that it's not necessarily a storm right up on the coast that can be very significant. It can be a storm literally 2,000 miles out in the ocean that does have significant impacts here in the Carolinas. Uh, for the seasonal outlook for 2020, this is produced by experts at the Climate Prediction Center uh, up at the uh, headquarters of the National Weather Service. The official outlook for this season is for 13 to 19 named storms. Of course, that's above the average of 12. Uh, six to ten hurricanes and three to six major hurricanes. In terms of the probability for what this season could bring here, there is a 60% chance we're going to see above normal activity, but only a 10% chance of below normal activity for this season. So we are anticipating this to be a fifth consecutive year of above normal activity in the Atlantic Ocean. Um, major hurricanes, of course, that's the ones we're uh, looking at for three to six there, would have winds of greater than 115 miles an hour. And we certainly, uh, at this point in the season, we can't predict where those are going to develop specifically, but we will be looking for those. And regardless of the outlook, uh, we always prepare for the worst. Even if we were saying that it was going to be below normal average season, uh, you would always still prepare for that one storm that could be uh, have a tremendous impact. Uh, look back to like 1992, for example, Hurricane Andrew hit South Florida. That, that was the A storm that hit in late August. So you went all the way through June, July, and to late August before you got a single hurricane. It wasn't a particularly outstanding year in terms of the number of storms, but that one storm is one of the most impactful systems ever to affect the United States there. So it just takes one, quite literally. For the 2020 season, we have already gone through three names in the list, Arthur, Bertha, and Cristobal. Uh, Cristobal was uh, named on June 2nd. That makes it the earliest we've ever had the third storm used on our list there. So certainly this season already setting records, even though we're just getting started here. And you can see this list goes all the way down through the uh, W storm. It, that would be if we had an extremely active season, uh, that would be what the 21st uh, storm in the alphabet uh, list there. Uh, this last this list, list was last used in 2014 and before that 20, 2008 and 2002 
we recycle the same list every six years and replace, of course, the storms that uh, become significant, retire those names. In terms of seasonal factors that we look for in uh, seasonal forecasting for hurricanes, we sort of use a forecast funnel approach, look at the large broad basin uh, things that sort of set the stage and then funnel our way down toward the individual disturbances that become the storms of note. Uh, we're gonna speak about the uh, Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation, the AMO that's been uh, causing this abnormally uh, active series of seasons we've been seeing for the past couple of decades. We'll look at the state of El Nino, otherwise known as ENSO here. Uh, also interseasonal influences like dust storms coming off Africa, water temperatures in different parts of the Atlantic. And then that gets down to your short-term influences, those individual tropical waves, those disturbances that can become the individual storms there. So starting off with the um, AMO, the Atlantic Ocean as a whole goes through a uh, undulation of water temperature anomalies, where for about 30 years, you've got warmer than normal water temps in the Atlantic. And then for about 30 years, you have cooler than normal water temps in the Atlantic. And this correlates pretty strongly with not just hurricane activity, but with other uh, weather that we see here in the Carolinas in terms of heat waves, extreme uh, cold outbreaks and snow. And you can see from this chart here, going all the way back to the 1870s, we've had alternating 30 year cycles of warm and cold Atlantic water temperatures with various effects here locally. Uh, we're gonna focus on the hurricane impacts from this though. And I wanna show for storms that have affected Southeastern North Carolina and Northeastern South Carolina, almost all the significant storms you see here on this list occurred during a warm phase of the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation, the AMO. In fact, there's only three storms on this list at all that occurred during those cold phases, uh, the most recent of which was Hurricane Hugo in 1989, again, showing that during periods of uh, less than active, uh, you know, basin-wide activity, you can still get a frightfully dangerous storm to develop. Uh, we are still within that 30-year active cycle that began back in the mid-1990s, and if the pattern holds, we will exit that around uh, the year 2025 or so. So still for the next five years, roughly, uh, we're still in a warm phase of the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation that uh, argues quite strongly for an increased risk for getting hurricanes in the, the western part of the Atlantic Ocean here. A second factor we look at in terms of setting the stage for seasonal activity is what we call ENSO or El Nino and La Nina. Basically, this is water temperatures in the Pacific Ocean. And you might be thinking, how on earth could uh, water temperatures even in a different ocean affect what goes on here in the Atlantic? Essentially, we have two phases to this. During an El Nino, that's when water temperatures in the Pacific here along the equator are above normal, we end up with a lot of extra thunderstorms forming over this warm water. Those thunderstorms don't remain there just over the Pacific. The moisture from those turns into jet streams that then blow across the Atlantic Ocean. That increases the wind shear here, which of course is an enemy of hurricanes. It weakens the storms and prevents many storms from forming. The uh, alternate case is La Nina, when the water temperatures are below normal in the tropical East Pacific. In this case here, that colder water causes fewer thunderstorms to develop, which means we have fewer of those strong jet streams blowing across the Atlantic Ocean during the heart of the tropical season. Those uh, fewer jet streams means less wind shear, less wind shear means more and stronger hurricanes potentially. So uh, that's how El Nino and La Nina can affect uh, what's going on here in the Atlantic. Now, where are we right now? Well. Uh, we are currently in neutral conditions, which, mean, which means neither El, Nino, El, neither El Nino nor La Nina are occurring, uh, but the uh, indications are that we may be drifting toward a La Nina by the heart of the hurricane season. We'll show you how uh, El Nino has affected uh, hurricane seasons. If we look at the last seven El Nino seasons, uh, 2015 back to 1994 there, those seven seasons in all produced 72 named storms and 31 hurricanes. Contrast that with the last seven La Nina seasons, 2016 back to 1995, where we had 115 named storms and 59 hurricanes. So you can see that obviously the difference between El Nino and La Nina, uh, during La Nina, we get a significantly larger number of storms and hurricanes. During a neutral season, which we're currently neutral right now, uh, you still have uh, more storms in El Nino, not quite as many as La Nina, so sort of in the middle, as you might expect there. This is the current uh, configuration to what the water temperatures look like in the tropical East Pacific. Uh, just recently here in the last uh, month or so, they started really trending below average after being above average for uh, much of the last year. So that's something we're going to watch for is what do these water temperatures do here in the tropical East Pacific? The forecast is for them to stay on the cool side, possibly drifting in a, into a La Nina phase by September. Should that occur, that would be another very positive factor for getting a lot of tropical storms and hurricanes for this season here. One other factor we look at in terms of seasonal activity is uh, rainfall across the Sahel region of Africa. 
Now, in Africa, you have the Sahara Desert to the north, where it almost never rains. You have the tropical rainforest, the Congo, in Central Africa along the equator. And in between is this Sahel region. It's a grassland area where you have years of lots of rain, followed by years of not much rain. And the, uh, when you have years of lots of rain, these tropical waves, these clusters of thunderstorms, are much more common as they move off into the Atlantic Ocean. These are the seed disturbances that will produce your tropical storms and hurricanes. In fact, most of the uh, hurricanes you can think of that have had big impacts here in the Carolinas have actually come from these tropical easterly waves that move off into the Atlantic and strengthen into tropical storms across the uh, Atlantic Ocean on their way here. The forecast for this season is unfortunately for above normal rainfall in the Sahel region. Should that occur as, as is forecast, we'll see a lot of these tropical waves moving across Africa into the Atlantic and uh, that will uh, provide a, a larger number of tropical storms and hurricanes uh, in the Atlantic Ocean. One last influence we look at is a Saharan air layer. Otherwise, uh, a simple way to put that is just dust storms that blow off the uh, Sahara Desert into the Atlantic Ocean. This dust uh, comes offshore at altitudes anywhere between five and 15,000 feet up in the air. And what it does is actually absorb sunlight up there, creating very, very a layer of warm air. Uh, this layer of warm air, 15,000 feet up, actually inhibits thunderstorms. It stops those storms from developing, which can actually reduce the intensity of individual storms that are trying to form in that area. This is a satellite picture that I grabbed here just from a couple days ago, showing one of these dust storms pushing off Africa into the Atlantic. That would obviously shut down anything trying to happen out there right now. And if we uh, have the, these Saharan air layers uh, continue through August and September, that would actually be a negative factor that would suppress the amount of hurricane activity. So one more factor that we look at uh, trying to determine how active the season might actually try to be. Uh, currently, the Saharan air layer is too early to be much of an influence on the Atlantic Ocean. We don't really look for that tropical wave activity in Africa to become a big factor until later into July and especially August and September when most of our significant storms form. And uh, one last factor we look at is water temperatures across what we call the main development region of the Atlantic Ocean. That's sort of the, the tropics and subtropics between Africa and the Caribbean. Uh, water temperatures there currently are a little bit above normal, which is, of course, is another positive factor. Uh, if the water temps are above normal in this area, a storm literally has more fuel to work with. Warm water temperatures are the fuel that uh, these storms use to, to grow, to strengthen, and possibly affect the United States there. And since they are above normal for the water temps, that's one more positive factor. So the forecast from all these factors together does look like an active season uh, coming up uh, for the uh, Atlantic Ocean and possibly for the Carolinas as well. And I'm going to transfer now over to Steve Path, who will take it from here. Okay, uh, thanks, Tim. Um, can you see my screen, Tim and Mike, just to double check? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, you know, thank you. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. And you know, my part of the presentation is the focus on just some storm considerations. You think about all the storms we've had over the years, especially the last couple of years. We had one approach us from the east, Florence, and then Dorian, uh, which is your your uh, more typical route of storms in our in our western part of the Atlantic Basin, uh, coming up from the south. And if you recall. Uh, with the impacts, you know, we had our, the arrival of some impacts uh, versus uh, some were a little bit slower, and that's a function of how the storm approaches the coast. So we'll talk about the various impacts with the angle of approach. Want to get into some of the, the changes with the hurricane program this, this year, and then talk about some of the messaging challenges we had before I turn it over to Mike. So let's let's start with the impacts and angle of approach. And you see the differences here. Florence, very atypical approach for our latitude and our longitude. Uh, Dorian is more of the, the principal track that we see something coming up from the south. And when we look at the various aspects with surge, and then we'll look at uh, rainfall, wind, and then tornadoes, with storm surge, a westerly track similar to what we had with Florence means that those er the area's strongest winds are gonna move on shore, which would enhance the surge. So basically we have the part of the storm that is the effective fetch, the part of the storm where the direction of motion is the same as the wind circulation around the storm. And with, with Florence in particular, it was on the uh, northern side. Uh, you get that effective fetch focused on the coast and you can have prolific storm surge. Now you can also have prolific storm surge with a parallel track 
especially if the center is closer to the coast. Now, Dorian, it was a little farther offshore, but a storm like with Hurricane Floyd or Fran coming in uh, from the south, you can have sig significant surge focused on these bays. With Hazel coming ashore near Calabash, there are storm surge above ground level over 18 feet in some parts of Brunswick County. So the shape of the coast is important, uh, but also the angle of approach. And it's extremely complex too, because you're talking about the size of the storm, the intensity of the storm. Is the peak surge going to occur with any tidal anomalies, astronomical tides, or are they at a full moon or, an, or a new moon? Uh, but, but either way, uh, surge is very complex, uh, but we certainly don't want to see where that effective fetch is focused right on the coastline, or if it's coincident with, with full moon and uh, other things going on. Uh, as far as the rainfall flooding, either track can provide significant impacts. You recall with Florence, we've had over 35 inches of, of rain. The orientation was generally from the southeast to the northwest, the axis of heavy rainfall. And with uh, Floyd coming up from the south, we had, we had over 18 inches of rain from Floyd, and the axis is usually a south to north type of configuration. So you can have significant rainfall either track, depending on the storm's forward speed, interaction with other synoptic features such as stationary fronts or, or cold fronts. Uh, so there's, uh, you know, again, another complex uh, situation uh, depending on a whole host of things. And then with wind, either track could provide significant impacts. Overall, it, it, it'll depend on the intensity of the storm and the proximity of the strongest winds associated with, with the eye wall. Uh, I think it was Hurricane Helene gave us the, the peak winds at the Wilmington Airport. Uh, Helene's track was offshore, but generally we see uh, storms that track onshore, we get those stronger winds able to move onshore as well. Now, the big differences with uh, Dorian and Florence was with tornadoes. Both storms generated 35 tornado warnings from the Wilmington office. I, I think we had about 18 storms, uh, tornadoes each with each storm. Uh, Florence probably had more. We just couldn't get to a lot of the areas in some of uh, Holly Shelter and some other things. Uh, but still, they're, both storms were prolific tornado makers. But if you recall with Dorian, the tornadoes were the first impacts to arrive. But with Florence, the tornadoes came basically came the day after the storm made landfall. And a lot of that has to do with uh, what is going to arrive first, the, in particular, the eastern half of the storm. That's where the, the shear is greatest to support rotating thunderstorms within the spiral bands. And that's the side of the storm that we typically will see more tornadoes. And with Dorian, that eastern half arrived into the Cape Fear area first, which is why tornadoes led the way of all the impacts. However, with Florence, the eastern half came a day after Florence made landfall. So we, we had eyewall winds from Florence that arrived first and then flash flooding. And then that Saturday, uh, the day after landfall, it, it shifted to primarily flash flooding and tornado outbreak. And when we look at a study uh, done by Roger Edwards at the Storm Prediction Center, and this is looking at the distribution of tornadoes with north relative. So if, if the center of the storm is right here and we're looking north, east, south, and west. Most of the tornadoes occur in the, the northern quadrant through the south-southeastern quadrants. You can get tornadoes in all quadrants of, of a storm, but most are on that eastern half, which is why I highlighted the eastern half with Dorian and Florence based off of that research. So the angle of approach is significant uh, into the various types of impacts that we can occur that can occur with each of the storms. So as far as some program changes that are that are coming up for this year, the, the first one we're excited about the being led by the National Hurricane Center is a graphical depiction of storm surge above ground level. And this was an example from Hurricane Dorian. They started doing these for social media uh, during Hurricane Florence and Hurricane Michael a couple of years ago uh, for their, you know, again, for their, their social media. But as, as far as a briefing tool, this is one graphic we're going to include. They're going to generate these with each advisory uh, as far as their other uh, and their suite of products. And I think it's a great 10,000 foot level of what the surge is expected to be. There are partners that we have that need information uh, down to town uh, 
town scale and county scale, and we have probabilistic storm surge data we can use to brief our partners on that. But this is a good overview of where the surge is expected to be highest. And, and again, it's very complex depending on the shape of the coast, the hydrology in the area, the angle of approach with the storm, the tides and all of that. Uh, but, but this is just a really good briefing slide that we'll be able to share with you this year. The other changes, the Hurricane Center, their forecast discussion, their reasoning behind what they're they're doing. It's a textual product. It, it will uh, it used to be valid out through 48 hours. They're now going out to 72 hours with their discussion. And that will be available with every advisory that they issue. And then a, another change that we have is the Hurricane Center is also going to be providing a 60-hour forecast point. Remember, it was 12, 24, 36, 48, and then it would jump to 72. Well, now there's going to be an, uh, a go-between point at 60 hours, which will help with any storm that has curvature. You know, People tend to think that uh, the storms move in straight lines when there's a lot of curvature and you have a big void between 48, 48 hours and 72 hours where that 60-hour point will help show the curvature a little bit better. As far as the wireless emergency alerts, now you will receive these on your phone when a hurricane warning, storm surge warning, or an extreme wind warning are issued. We hope to never have to issue any of these, and in particular extreme wind warning, because we reserve those for the for landfalling major hurricanes and their eyewall uh, winds associated with that with them. We you know knock on wood, we haven't had to issue one here in Southeast North Carolina. Uh, we we would for something like Fran or for, for Hazel. So it'll just be a matter of time before we have to do it. Hopefully just not uh, anytime soon. And the last of the, the changes they're implementing this year is in an in a, uh, online software called Hervac. It is for decision makers. Uh, they have access to that. But there's experimental wind departure information for 34 and 50 knot winds. Recall over the last couple of years, there have been experimental and now operational arrival time of winds, so when, when, how much time do we have before the tropical storm force winds are expected to begin? Well, when you think about going through an event, the arrival winds are important, but also when is it safe wind-wise to get back out and begin the recovery and the responses that, that need to occur? So that wind departure information is going to be a great tool uh, starting this year for decision makers uh, to, to have to determine when it's safe at least to get rigs and, and equipment back on on the road when the winds are expected to decrease. And some reminders, like this example on the left-hand side, a key messages slide that's generated with every advisory, and it's on uh, social media by the National Hurricane Center. You know, we strongly encourage anybody uh, who has a function with messaging, emergency managers, PIOs, our media partners, I mean, you guys all, all know this, uh, but it's a great unifying message for the particular impacts and challenges that a storm is expected to bring bring us. So here's, a, here's an example of, of Florence. And uh, you know, again, we all wanna be, be unified with our message that helps limit the fog of war that is out there. Uh, with all the misinformation that is on the internet, um, this is a great message to keep everybody focused on. So remember, uh, regarding this key information by the Hurricane Center and even the local weather service offices, you know, we do have Twitter and Facebook accounts, and for the Wilmington office, you can see uh, we are, oop, my slide progression here is messing up. For the Wilmington office, the Twitter handle is at NWS Wilmington NC. Our Facebook is NWS Wilmington NC. And for the National Hurricane Center, their Twitter that you should be following for the Atlantic desk is at NHC underscore Atlantic, and we will be sharing the broad this this broadcast and this recording with everybody, so uh, you'll have uh, this information. All right, public messaging challenges that we face, and we will, we're going to continue to deal with this uh, for a long time as a result of the Saffir Simpson scale. Uh, there's just too much focus remains on the storms category. When you talk with uh, people. Um, you ask them about what are their plans, and you know, ultimately you hear, well, I'm not going to evacuate unless it's a Category 2 or a Category 3. Uh, you know, Remember, the Saffir Simpson scale is only the intensity of the wind with the storm. There are a whole host of other hazards that we have to concern ourselves with, 
we would encourage people to be making their plans to stay or go. Certainly, if a mandatory evacuation is invoked by emergency management, follow the advice of local emergency managers. But ultimately, it depends on how individual impacts are going to um, cause damage or potential issues for each individual. And that, that is unique for each individual. People live in different types of homes. People live near tidal creeks. People live near rivers and creeks. Some people are in high elevation, uh, higher elevation areas. So it, it depends on each individual situation, not just the Saffir Simpson scale should dictate what people do to stay safe. When a storm is weakening or degrading, we need to avoid these types of terms because they imply that everything is getting better. And Florence was a perfect case of that. Hurricane Florence moved ashore. It quote unquote weakened from a category one hurricane to a tropical storm and then tropical depression. But even though the storm was weakening intensity, the tornado and flash flood impacts were actually increasing. So it was a very dangerous situation that was going on. And if we use terms, if we pick, a, pick the wrong term to use, uh, then we're gonna find ourselves in, in trouble. You'll, you'll often tr see people trying to get back too early when the dangers are actually increasing. And reminder that there are many ways to die, become injured before, during, and after a storm. We need to carefully message any and avoid any risky actions through all phases. And I'll show some examples of uh, some of the issues we've run into with that. Uh, this is from the National Hurricane Center, Dan Brown, Mike, Dr. Mike Brennan, you know, don't focus on one model, trust the specialists. And I'll show you a chart that, that shows their skill versus any one model. And then lastly, with, with social media in particular, please validate before sharing know your source, point people towards credible sources. And I put this analogy up here, do you want me doing heart surgery on you? Uh, I'm a trained meteorologist. I am not a heart specialist, but I do know what an aorta is. I know what arterial sclerosis is. I can probably point out on, on your body where your right ventricle is, but do you really want me doing heart surgery on you? So there's a lot of people that are enthusiasts, which is great, um, but you gotta remember, uh, a lot of times these, uh, these these people that don't have the background that the hurricane center specialists do or trained meteorologists do often will share bad information that can that can skew the overall unified message. So point people to valid sources. Don't share it just because you can uh, with misinformation. So it's only a category one. These slides are from Dan Brown, who shared them with us just to talk about recap category one storm since 2010. They've caused 175 direct fatalities, hundreds of indirect fatalities. They've cost the nation 105 billion in loss and some of the notable storms up here. And you've, you've heard of some of these, Florence, Sandy, Sandy, catastrophic storm surge damage in New Jersey, New York was only a category one storm. Florence, only a category one storm at landfall uh, caused catastrophic flooding and tornado damage in our area. So it, the category is just one small piece of a complex situation. Focus on the impacts. Now, with that in mind, uh, there are times where Saffir Simpson scale is important. The National Hurricane Center will rely on Saffir Simpson scale if the wind is going to be a significant impact in the overall system. Hurricane Michael was a perfect example. It was projected to be a category four at landfall. You need to ramp up messaging with the wind and the Saffir Simpson scale when it's that type of situation. But they will avoid that when there are other impactful things going on uh, with the weaker storms. Here's another Dan Brown slide, uh, using downgraded or weakened, please know, keep the focus on the life-threatening hazards that are out there. Uh, the left side was, was an example how you can get um, maybe a better sense that things are improving. Florence downgraded to a category one hurricane. Uh, but on the right side, you can see what the National Hurricane Center is doing in their message with, with Florence, focusing on surge, focusing on rainfall, and, um, and letting people know there's still deadly situation going on with it. So again, stay focused on the hazards. Don't get baited by downgraded or weakened. This is a uh, study from Rappaport and Blanchard a few years ago uh, showing the breakdown of indirect fatalities. Now, when I mean direct and indirect, 
direct fatality would be a tree is blown down onto a home that crushes someone and kills them. An indirect fatality would be uh, wind blows down a tree across the road. 20 minutes later, a car drives into it during, during at, at 65 miles per hour and they get killed. So that's an indirect. Another indirect fatality would be carbon monoxide poisoning. A direct fatality would be a flooding victim from storm surge or from flash flooding. So we, we kind of break them down because you can learn information about the data that comes in if you parse it a little bit more. But when you look at indirect deaths by age, there are eight times as many victims over age 660 as under 21 year olds. And if you think about after storm comes through, there's stress, there's anxiety. So there's there's that that mental aspect that's destabilizing one's, one's health uh, going on. And then you have the damage occur. You have uh, long periods of, of power outages. It's hot and humid air mass, typically the big tropical air mass that follows these storms uh, on the heels of the storms. You have people working out, outside and they're overexerting themselves and they're increasing the risk for cardiovascular type of health issue with that. And that's why the numbers are, are higher for over 60 year olds than under 21 year olds. And when you look at the breakdown of deaths of seniors age uh, 60, uh, greater than 60, and you break it down into the various categories, you know, the, over 45%, the, the bulwark of the, these fatalities are, are cardiovascular related. So I think we need to be careful uh, with, with uh, special messaging uh, for different groups, but anyone uh, can suffer from an indirect fatality at, at any age. We've had many different types. The, the top left example, we had uh, an elder, elderly person putting up hurricane boards on their home before Dur Dorian and fell off a ladder and died. We had a contractor killed in the cleanup after Dorian uh, with a chainsaw. Uh, accident uh, after Florence. We've had many people in North Carolina fall off the roofs of their home trying to put tarps to cover up the roof damage, falling off the roof or a ladder. And we even had one after Florence cleaning up debris, cut his leg on the debris, walked through polluted water and got sepsis and died within two days. So it's not just the wind, it's not just the surge or the tornadoes. We got to think of uh, the whole scope of fatalities, direct and indirect for these events. And this uh, is a Dan Brown slide as well. You know, there's spaghetti models versus the Hurricane Center forecast. Please stick with the Hurricane Center forecast. They have over 175 years of combined experience. And when you look at this chart of, of their performance versus the GFS model, the European model, the UK model, their forecast skill is a higher percentage the entire dura uh, duration of an event from 12 hours out to 120 hours out. These guys know the model biases. These guys know um, which models are performing better uh, than, than others and they're able to um, take advantage of, of that and the biases, the model biases that are out there. And Dr. Brennan uh, said this a couple of years ago and it resonated with me. If you only rely on one model, then you're doomed to fail. And some model, the GFS does better than the European. Uh, sometimes some events, the GFS does better than the European model and, and vice versa. You got to look at a whole host of things and not just one particular model and the perturbation of models that are that are out there and they have access to all of that. Just uh, real quick about social media. Again, validate your information. We see fake headlines, content and graphics. You see it before a storm. Uh, occurs usually that's that sensationalized model or forecast information you'll get out of a thousand models you'll get per, a person post the one that brings the category five to the coast and ignores 999 of the other models you'll see it during events you get regurgitated information from old events and impacts and immediately after events you see manipulated images uh, one of the, the the ones from hurricane harvey a few years ago showed the airport in Houston flooded and only the, the tail of the aircraft at, at the airport uh, above the water, or you see sharks in the water, those types of things. Uh, so just be careful before, during, and after you will see these things. The, the fake information occurs in worst case scenarios. They're only, again, they're only showing that one type of thing. They're hijacking credible sources. That picture to the right is, is the uh, a hurricane center 
framework and they took Hurricane Irma and extended the forecast and brought it right to the Texas coast who just suffered from Hurricane Harvey that year. So they're, they're, they're taking over graphics and making them look official. And then uh, you know, being able to identify fake weather information is, is a, a good starting point. Does the image make sense? Like the one on the right, the caption is Hurricane Harvey rolling in from a cargo ship 90 miles out from Corpus Christi. Well, if Harvey's a Category 4 storm, do you think that the ocean is going to look like a lake in that picture there? All that was was a thunderstorm in the distance from a cargo ship. So the picture is, is real, but the situation was not. So just you know, be mindful. You might be able to pick out some cues uh, if it's real or not. Can you validate it through a web search? You can copy an image into, into Google and it'll tell you if it's already out there. So there are ways to validate it. But just overall, you know, help us stop the spread of false weather information. This fake information could go viral quickly. And unfortunately, you can skew that unified message so much that it might impact decisions people make regarding their life and safety. So we've got to be careful. If you see misinformation, direct it towards, uh, direct the good information from the Hurricane Center or emergency management websites, you know, you know, get get that in there, steer it to the right path. All right, just some key points before I turn it over to Mike Kachasek. Uh, we, you know, the Cape Fear area, all parts of North and South Carolina, coastal areas, we have a significant hurricane history. The problem is only going to increase as the area continues to grow uh, based on our hurricane climatology. If we haven't learned from our past, then we haven't learned anything yet. Um, we, we're, we're good at planning for events that have occurred before, but are we going to be able to handle events that we haven't seen in a long time, like Hurricane Hazel, Category 4, the type of situation? Uh, so we have that history. We need to be prepared regardless of what the forecast is. Remember that the storm's intensity, size, angle of approach is going to dictate the impacts. Uh, we can't let our guard down if it's an easterly to west track or south to north track. We, we got to look at more of the details to determine what those impacts are going to be. And there are, are factors that contribute to what happens during each hurricane season. And the main point after everything that Tim went through, and he mentioned this, regardless of the forecast, all it takes is one. We need to prepare regardless of the situation, regardless of that forecast from year to year. And then uh, to reiterate the indirect fatalities, we've got to avoid risky actions before, during, and after hurricane, and also be prepared for fake weather information. It's going to happen, but also be prepared to direct it to the credible source of information. All right, um, Mike, I'm going to make you the presenter so we can finish up the presentation with your overview. Excellent, thank you, Steve, and good morning, everyone. I am Mike, and I will be your tour guide here for some awesome tools that are online that can help you out. And I'll turn on my webcam here, hopefully you can see me, that way you can see who's talking at you. Here we go, all right, so let's put that down and uh, get going here. Oh, before I get going, um, there's some questions that you can ask in the questions box. Also, there's a chat option if you want to chat us and ask a question in that way too for myself or Steve or Tim here. And when I'm done going through some of these tools, you'll have a chance to ask questions and we can open up the floor, open or unmute your mic and uh, we can chat. So feel free to ask questions as we go and uh, we'll get to them afterwards here. So the first place that you can go for some cool tools is weather.gov. Gov for government. We're still confused sometimes with .com. That is Stephanie Abrams and Jim Cantori. If you want Steve past forecast, if you want Tim Armstrong or the rest of our talented meteorologists at the office, you'll go to weather.gov to get our information. So you'll see this big map here at weather.gov and you can click on any spot in the country and get a tailored forecast for that location. So even if you're traveling outside of the Carolinas and want to get a forecast, you can still do that on weather.gov. But we're gonna go ahead and zoom in on our area. So you click on Northeastern South Carolina and Southeastern North Carolina here, and you'll come to the Wilmington office. This is a good page to bookmark because this is a lot of fun information for you that will help you make decisions, weather.gov slash ILM. Or you can click on the map on the front and get to the same place here. So if you wanna get a forecast for, let's say we're gonna go over to Lumberton. We'll click on Lumberton here. 
the page will pop up and it'll talk about hazardous conditions right here if you follow my bouncing cursor for Lumberton area. Looks like there's a flood warning in effect. The river there is running high. It will give you the closest observation available, what's going on there. So it looks like 63 degrees in the area and give you your seven day forecast here. Lots of rain in the forecast and some cool conditions for June. More details follow here if you'd like to know some more of the nitty gritty details into the forecast by day. If you would like to get the forecaster's thoughts, the forecast discussion sits right here. If you click on that right there, you can get the actual thoughts of the forecaster sitting behind the desk that designed the forecast and created it and know a little bit about what's going on behind the scenes. So that's a cool place to get some thoughts too. If you're a graph visual person like I am, you can have uh, your radar here. You can click and see what's going on in the uh, current radar. You can also visit the satellite here, the hourly weather graph. And here's a digital portion of our forecast. This is the National Digital Forecast Database. And you can view your certain areas and towns. You can even hover over, hover over excuse me. Here's Fayetteville forecast. You can get Myrtle Beach. There's Wilmington there, and you got all sorts of different parameters here on the side. You got max and min temperature. You have different temperatures based on time of day. You can have wind gusts, cloud cover, precipitation, and this is what's coming out of our local forecast. So that's a, a nice little stop if you want to go there. If you're looking more for points, or I clicked on Lumberton here to start. So this is Lumberton. If you scroll down to the bottom, over here on the right, here's something called the hourly weather forecast. So let's go ahead and click on this guy. So what you're seeing here is for the point of Lumberton or your point of interest, wherever you want to click, it will give you hour by hour temperature, dew point, wind speed, wind gust, and direction is on this chart. You have relative humidity, you have precipitation chances, and uh, I think this is chances of thunder right here. Yep. So you can get a lot of information right here on the hourly weather graph if you'd like, and um, a lot of good information there to help you out make your decisions. So let's back up a step. Let's go back to weather.gov. Let's say you're coming in the front page, and you click for our area of Wilmington. Hold down to the very bottom. There's some secret links. Now there's a lot of cool stuff here too. A newly created weather story where you get a quick snippet of what's going on, uh, the big story of the weather. Radar and satellite are here as well. There's also some here for specific tropical marine forecasts and some other information. You can see our social media pages and we post some fun things there too. But here's some secret hidden links at the very bottom of the page. And one that is cool to bookmark would be the weather activity planner right here. So let's go ahead and click on that guy. And this is also another version of a point forecast. So when you click on the weather activity planner, if you have an activity going on for your certain point of interest, you can determine certain ranges if you'd like for um, what's important to you. So for example, let's say you have a Boy Scout Jamboree uh, camping trip that's outside for a weekend in Florence. So we're gonna click on Florence here in a minute, but you can't have the temperature because the Boy Scouts um, although they always come prepared, it's a little bit hot for some of the, the kids. So let's say you don't want the temperature going any lower than 60 because it's a little bit too chilly, and you don't want the temperature going any higher than 80 because that's a little bit too warm. And because they'll be intense, let's also say we want to look at the wind speed. And we don't want the wind speed getting any higher than, let's say, 20 miles per hour for Florence. So if you click on Florence right here, and we have these variables right in here, a little graph will pop up that will help us decide when we can actually have the Boy Scouts outside camping. So when you see up here, this little graph is created and you have little bars. The red one here is temperature and the purple looking one here is wind speed. Anywhere that's highlighted means that it's within your specified range. So for the temperature, these red bars mean that the temperature will be between 60 and 80. If you hover over it, just down here below the chart, you'll see the values. You can see 67, you can see the wind, speed, and direction. 
and looks like we're not going to have winds in the forecast at all go above 20 so that's that's good so very good on the wind through this period so this weekend if you're planning on the weekend you could have it maybe overnight saturday overnight sunday and you'd be in good shape so that's a cool place to go visit for any of your plans some people on the call here probably have the prestigious title of emergency manager and emergency managers quick information at the bottom special to your counties so let's scroll down to the bottom it's right here em briefing under the hazard section of our secret links so if you click on em briefing it will take you to a page where you can click on your county once it loads up here and see specifically what's going on in your area So here we go, we got it loaded up here. And you can see the different offices here. If you wanted to jump to Charleston or Newport weather, that's also Moorhead City, Raleigh or Columbia, more inland, you can click on those offices and get what they're thinking. But here's your specific counties that you can click on. So let's say something's going on in Georgetown County. So let's go ahead and click on Georgetown. This page is set up specifically for the EM of Georgetown. And I'm not sure if the EM from Georgetown is on the call or not, but for any EM, you can send to us events that you're concerned with that are going on in your county, and we can add those to the side here. And you can have specific forecasts for any of these locations or events. So medical facilities, uh, we have Georgetown Memorial Hospital, Waccamaw Community Hospital. If you click on these, specific forecast for just that area. There's also a tabular forecast that you can click and go for. If you like graphs, you can see it in a graph format. Down below here, you have the different radar uh, options that you can look at different procedures there um, that are set up for wind-based signatures on radar, precipitation based on radar, and the composite, like what's going on right now out in your area. So those are some cool tools. Um, I saw Steve highlighted his presentation that you can go visit the Storm Prediction Center. That's the SPC. It's a good page to bookmark. And don't worry if you're not catching all this right now. We can send out the important links uh, in email afterwards. That way you have a chance to bookmark them if you didn't catch them in this presentation. Also, it'll be recorded so you can go back and reference it for material too. But here's the Storm Prediction Center, and this is the current day outlook. So we have a couple general thunder areas here and marginal risks for severe weather. If you go down the page a little bit, I believe, not loading up yet, but there's a little bit of a legend that will pop up down below. There it is. It'll tell you what each of the risk categories mean. Oh, no, tomorrow's going to have a slight risk. So where's this going to be? Let's click on day two and see where this goes. Hopefully not for our area. So if we look and see for day two, if you're worried about tomorrow, oh, okay, good. Slight risk is only for the Dakotas, North and South Dakota. We do have a general thunder area here that we're not expecting severe weather at this time. So this is a cool place to go uh, in the winter, not, excuse me, tropical season. The National Hurricane page will probably be a very good friend of yours. That is nhc.noaa.gov. And the Storm Prediction Center doesn't want to let me go. Here we go. So Steve showed some really cool graphics for if we're expecting a hurricane for time of arrival, wind tools, uh, uh, storm surge tools. Usually it'll be right up here at the top, top news of the day. You will see if there's a hurricane coming our way or a tropical storm, there'll be a link right here to click on and you'll go to a central hub of all kinds of data that will help make decisions for you. You can also click on the map down here. There'll be a little red a circle for the hurricanes or tropical storms that you can click on and get more information that way. And there's all kinds of different tools and secret links down at the bottom too. It's easy to get lost on some of these pages because there's so much good information. But that being said, if you ever have any questions, uh, the websites are up 24 seven, but so are the meteorologists at the weather office. And we're happy to answer any of your questions. If you get lost on some of these pages, if you need something, some kind of support, we're happy to help there too. 
but a lot of your questions can be answered just online here go into some of these um, forecast pages so with that that's about all I had I did see some questions start creeping in Steve so um, I guess we can go ahead and start um, I'll hide my webcam so that way you're not looking at me unless you want to take the presentation back there Steve yes I go ahead. Can you hear me Mike yes all right uh, did you want to go through the questions then Yes, we had a comment here um, about Hurovac. It was uh, Kevin Cowball. I hope I said that right, Kevin. Um, he said, I don't believe the timing graphic in Hurovac that shows the departing time of the tropical storm force winds is quite ready yet. Um, I don't know if Kevin has a microphone or not. If he'd be willing to talk a little bit about that, we can unmute him. If he had a comment that he'd like to make to the group. Let's see, can I find Kevin in our list? We had good attendance today. Thank you everyone for attending and taking some time out of your day to, to join us here. We really appreciate it. Um, let's see, do we see Kevin? Yeah, I see him. Do you want me to unmute him? Yeah, go ahead, un unmute him if he's willing to, to, to talk. All right, Kevin, are hey, you there? Can you hear me? All right, so last we heard, uh, Sea Island Software was still trying to get that departing time graphic updated. Um, they hope to have it done in the next couple of weeks, but I just wanted to know if there was a storm this week or next week. Uh, it wouldn't be in there yet. Uh, they do have training led by Sea Island Software, the Army Corps, and FEMA next week. And I believe day two, we'll talk about the new timing graphics, but I don't think it's quite ready yet. And I saw Kevin listed the, uh, I'm sure not everybody can see it, but there is a link that you listed, Kevin, we appreciate it, the HERVAC training, and we'll send that out uh, with uh, the email with the recording for this, if that's okay. Hearing nothing, I'm assuming it's okay. So we had another question from Otis White, actually. Um, maybe this is more geared towards Tim, if he's around still. Um, we seem to be experiencing a very wet season as we did with Florence, and that's true. How will this affect the flooding as we have the storms hit? Any comments on that? Yeah, hey, this is Tim. Uh, yeah, we certainly are in a very wet pattern. We're, uh, we had a, a fairly wet spring across the Carolinas, and of course, now that we're into meteorological summer into June, uh, it's raining like cats and dogs out there. Soils are saturated. Uh, the outlook for the remainder of the summer up through the heart of the hurricane season is for uh, enhanced chances of above normal rainfall. So I don't see much potential. We're gonna dry things out significantly. Obviously it's not gonna rain like this all the way through September, thankfully, but uh, the, the odds do favor having very wet soils, high river levels continuing uh, in, into the heart of the hurricane season. So should we get into a storm situation, it, it wouldn't have to be a Florence, just a, you know your more uh, typical, you know weaker uh, tropical system, the chances of flooding would be uh, enhanced much higher than you normally would see in just a normal situation. So that will be something we watch for very closely. And it also probably depends on the angle of um, approach by the hurricane. Is that right, Steve? Yeah, and especially the way that the you know, the antecedent conditions that Tim is talking about. I mean, you, just imagine Florence if it had the antecedent conditions that Floyd had. You know, everything was saturated then. Uh, it's just a strike against us having this wet pattern in place as we head into uh, deeper into hurricane season. But the angle of approach, you know, is it, is it slow moving storm could could be bad. It, 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 it could be a tropical storm, tropical storm Allison that uh, moved ashore along the Texas coast, I, I believe produced over 35 inches of rain and it quote unquote was only a tropical storm. So there's there's a lot of background factors and you know, Otis brings up a good point with with their rainfall, and uh, you know, we we certainly would rather have it much drier. We don't want a drought, but we, you know, we want it much drier heading into the peak of hurricane season. We had another question here for Steve, um, and please keep the questions coming. By the way, um, these are all great questions so far. Um, we, we like the questions in the, the discussion here. So Steve, this is from Ricky. Are, are the breakpoints still the same for tropical systems? And have there been any that have been added? 
you know, our, our breakpoints are the same. They seem to work very well uh, for us. Uh, so there have been no, no changes at this time. Okay, very good. Does everybody know what breakpoints are? Do you want to give a quick? Yeah, that's a, a, a good point too. You know, uh, where the hurricane warnings or watches are, are, are defined, Surf City to Cape Lookout for example. So the, the, the locations that could be geographical locations or, or cities, we have a set of um, breakpoints that we use that, that are standard for us to communicate the hurricane watches and warnings and tropical storm watches and warnings. Okay. We have a question from Timothy here, and I guess this could be for our Timothy, if you want. Uh, what qualifying factors are necessary in order for a storm to be named? Well, sure, I'll take that one. Uh, this is uh, Tim. I'm good to hear your question there, Timothy. To be named, we look for a storm to have a circulation. In other words, it's uh, rotating completely like a, uh, you know, the winds are swirling completely around it, opposite direction, the hands of a clock move. We call it uh, counterclockwise circulation. It has to be a tropical system, meaning that it's deriving its energy from uh, water temperature, warm water temperatures. It's not along a front. It's not from an upper level system or whatever. Uh, once those two are satisfied, then we look at the wind speeds. Once the sustained wind speeds reach 39 miles an hour, it's now considered to be a tropical storm and it receives a name. And that's that list that I showed that uh, starts with A, goes all the way down to the W storm for each year. Uh, we, it receives the next, next name off the list there. Uh, prior to that, we call those tropical depressions when the winds are less than 39 miles an hour, but it still satisfies the criteria for being a tropical system, a complete circulation, and it's deriving energy from the warm water. And of course, once the winds hit 74 miles an hour or greater, we call it a hurricane at that point. Very good, Tim, thanks. I missed that we had a hand raised. Um, I can unmute Ricky Farrington. Ricky, you're unmuted now. Did you have something to add for your question? Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can, go ahead. Okay, uh, when you were talking about hourly forecasts back there on the, on the home page, uh, yes. It, is is that still a, a valid tool for landfalling tropical systems? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I, I would say yes. We still produce forecasts even during tropical landfalling hurricanes. Uh, for a, a greater big picture approach, you could always go to the hurricane center. And of course, if the hurricane center is highlighting something, we will certainly be highlighting it as well. But um, I believe, and Steve, correct me if I'm wrong, or Tim, but that's still a valid forecast, correct? Yeah, we're we're you know we're we're being driven by the Hurricane Center's forecast, so they're you know the big picture, and we're providing the local impacts. So, but you know, we we've got to be a little bit more deterministic with some of our things, expected winds, um, you know, uh, the temperatures and those sorts of things. So, I mean, we we incorporate the wind field that the Hurricane Center is forecasting into our our wind forecast and uh, coming up with everything so it's lockstep as best we can. Okay, Ricky, did that answer your question? Uh, yes, it did. Thanks a lot, guys. Yes, thanks, Ricky. Thanks for the question. And please keep the questions coming. These are awesome. Uh, we had another uh, question here. Will the presentation be available? Yes, so Stephanie, just a reminder for everyone, this is being recorded and will be shared afterwards. So if you missed any part of the presentation, you will get the entire recording sent to you. Steve, there's a question for you here. So with the new revised hurricane projections with intermediate hours being included, what percentage of precision would you say they can expect? That's a now, good this question. Is, if this is talking about the, the, the forecast cone, which is a good thing to bring up, we haven't talked about it you know we we don't want to look at storm track based on a skinny line that we we follow we know storms can be you know 300 to 800 miles across and impacts can occur well outside of the cone uh, but statistically speaking and you, so we're adding the 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 um, 60 hour forecast point in the advisories that cone is defined by when the center is expected to be uh, is is in the cone statistically 66 uh, and a third percent of the time. Uh, so the, you know the, the 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 storm can go outside of the cone, but it's it's generally in that that 66 percent of the time uh, window where we see it. So that wouldn't change 
for the intermediate 60 hour point that's in there would be the same percentage. Steve, did we have a cone in the presentation? Not in this one. Okay, I don't know if we have a quick one that we could just do a quick uh, 30 second spiel on what the cone is. Um, it's always a kind of a good thing to review, I think for some. Um, I don't know if you have one handy, but we can keep going if, if not, because um, there's other questions here. Uh, let's see, actually more of a comment. Uh, Yes, it's, it's okay to share the Hervac link. That, that, that's that's a good, uh, thanks, thanks Kevin. We appreciate that. Um, let's see, I think I think that's all the questions we've got right now. Um, if anybody else has any comments they'd like to make, feel free to raise your hand or send the questions in. You have us till 12.30, I believe. We're willing to, to talk with you if you'd like. It uh, looks like Rick Sorrenti has raised his hand. Rick, can you hear us? You are unmuted that you have to unmute yourself. How are we doing guys? Steve, thanks for having us in here today. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, Rick. go ahead. Super, super, thank you. One of the, uh, I sent that question in about the intermediate hours being included and in what type of precision. As these models continue to mature, I know you guys have sat back in your chairs philosophically contemplating the percentage of accuracy we can expect to see in the future. You know, several years ago when, when I was actively involved in, in this trade that you guys are in now, you know, we'd sit back and say, well, you know, it kind of sort of was maybe could be, but it may not be. What kind of percentage of accuracy are you guys now thinking you're going to be getting from these models as this capability continues to mature? Yeah, and, I, and this is Steve. I don't, I don't think we can give a specific number, but if overall trends, especially when you look at the hurricane centers, track errors have just gone down phenomenally over the last two decades. And the more we invest in our modeling infrastructure and the more we invest in the research and the coupling of oceans and, atmos and the ocean environment and the atmosphere, we should see those percentages increasing with the intensity forecasts as we are uh, with the great trends we're seeing with the track forecast. So we're able to, to highlight certain areas of the coast and limit, I guess, what would be the, the false alarm over a larger scale and really bear down the focus of where the impacts are expected to, to occur. Uncertainty is always going to exist uh, because there is no perfect model out there. Uh, it's, it's very difficult when you're dealing with storms in an environment where there's very little information. You know, the, there's buoy data, the hurricane hunters are so important. Satellite data is so important. Radar is important. So you see the importance of that observational framework that's in place, uh, because without observations, you can have the perfect model, but it'll be useless because it doesn't have a starting point. So weather balloons, uh, airplane reports, ship reports, all of that is commingled. And as the modeling computation increases and gets better and the physics packages behind these models get better. We're certainly headed the right direction. But but until then, you know, that uncertainty is going to exist, but that uncertainty is getting smaller and smaller as we push forward. So can you still hear me? Yes. Uh, you mentioned buoys. You know, a couple of years ago, uh, several of us were engaged in trying to get our congressional representation to provide funding for the buoys that were deactivated along the North Carolina coast. Uh, has any of that funding appeared or reappeared, or are we still dealing with the same set of buoys? I, I think we're seeing advances with some of the cooperative networks that the universities run and ocean observing networks. And we're fortunate in the Cape Fear area, we have we have uh, UNCW Center for Marine Science that, that uh, is part of CORMP, the Coastal Ocean research monitoring program, and they have done a phenomenal uh, job working not only with its partners in the weather service, but partners in emergency management, lifeguards, and, and other stakeholders uh, with their deployment of various buoy systems that are out there. And, and fortunate for us, we're able to look at that data, and they actually send a lot of the data through the National Data Buoy Center. So there are cooperative opportunities that are out there that help fill in a lot of the holes that we have. Um, but when, you, when you're talking about a forecast environment, 
you know, having a Gulfstream aircraft that can gather data uh, at the, of the upper level environment ahead of the storms. You have hurricane hunters that go right into the hurricane and, and take uh, just critical information and and the buoy networks that are out there uh, through the buoy center, they're, they're you know they're they're fewer and farther between as you go farther offshore. Uh, so that's it's 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 all about the observations. But fortunately, getting back to your your question, uh, Rick, is you know we're, we're fortunate to have partners in the academic world through these ocean observing programs that can help us. Super, thank you. Thanks, Rick, for the question. And uh, Steve, I shared an old cone graphic here from Hurricane Sandy. I don't know if you can see it or want to kind of talk about it real quick. Yeah, and then you know this. Oh, you got the you got the cone picture up on your screen, not mine. Um, but you notice the cone as as the hur the hurricane center's track errors decrease, the cone decreases. You know, they're, we're taking advantage of the skill that that they have by alerting less less people. So basically, in this particular cone, you know, the Carolinas look okay with with Sandy. Uh, it shows the, the the storm's intensity, S being tropical storm, H being hurricane. If it's become to become a major hurricane, category three, four, five, it would have an M on there. But basically, with this track, we're saying that that Sandy is going to be in this cone 66 percent of the time so there's just enough uncertainty where it can get outside the cone but this is the overall general trend in in the track that we're we're seeing so the we don't we want to be very careful when you're dealing with people looking at this cone as and treating it as an impact cone people i've heard people over the years say oh we're out of the cone we're going to be good but you know the storm is 600 miles across and we are going to get heavy rain and storm surge from it so it's it's I think the first key point I would have for you is this is not an impact cone, but it is a cone to help people better understand all of the uncertainty that is out there, and it's expected to be at least statistically somewhere in that cone uh, throughout the next five days. And I think Tim was showing, and Tim, feel free to comment that even storms, you know, a thousand, two thousand miles away, can create dangerous uh, surf for us you know, even if it's not coming our way directly. That's correct. And I also want to mention that uh, a storm doesn't even have to be right here on us to have tremendous impacts. If you remember about 10 years ago, a hurricane named Joaquin stayed uh, hundreds of miles off the coast, but moisture from that was back toward the coast and produced one of South Carolina's greatest flooding disasters ever. So even the hurricane itself may not even be uh, right here on us, but still have tremendous impacts. Excellent. Um, I see Ricky Farrington raise his hand again. Um, I, I can't, I just, I'm sorry, I, I just lowered your hand there, Ricky. We'll have to get back to you. Rick, can you raise your hand again, Ricky? And we'll, 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 we'll call on you again. Um, there's another question here from Dennis. Um, is it possible to have a tornado from a tropical system that may not be warned, similar to a severe thunderstorm warning that never progresses into a tornado warning? Yeah, this is Steve. I mean, we, there are times where the rotation can be so small and far enough away from the radar where there are just uh, natural physical limitations. You can't beat the science. You can't beat physics, basically, where there could be unwarned events. And statistically, across the agency, I believe 70, it's around 70 percent of um, is the probability of detection for, for tornadoes. Uh, with uh, Florence and with Dorian, I believe we were pushing 90% detection. Uh, so it's it's a great system. There are some limitations uh, that uh, that we have to deal with, unfortunately. Just you know, again, you just can't beat physics. You know, the curvature of the Earth, uh, the beam spreading that occurs, uh, the the small rotation that is characteristic of of the tropical cyclone tornadoes. And to compare and contrast them, uh, you know, tropical cyclone tornadoes will spin down from the lowest part of the hurricane of, of the thunderstorm with this tornado. Uh, the planes, the, the classic tornado alley uh, tornadoes, uh, they spin down from the middle part of the thunderstorm. So there's a little bit more lead time with the classic tornadoes, and a little bit less lead time uh, when you look at the overall statistics with tropical cyclone tornadoes because they spin down quicker. 
Thanks, Steve. And hopefully that answers your question there, Dennis. Uh, we found Ricky again. Ricky, you are unmuted. Can you hear us? Yes, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Okay. This is kind of a hydro question, uh, either Steve or Tim uh, or whoever, but uh, is fresh water flooding of as is tidal? Uh, is, is fresh water still uh, responsible for most of all the deaths in, in the, uh, statistically now for tropical landfall, tropical systems? Tim, you want that one? I was going to defer to you. My understanding is that freshwater flooding is still the number one killer. Uh, it wasn't with last season. We saw you know, the, the preponderance of deaths here in the United States anyway from uh, root current fatalities, but still with Hurricane Florence and uh, looking back through history to Floyd, for example, I believe freshwater flooding is still number one. Yeah, Tim, Tim you're, you're right on, especially our, the storms in our area, uh, those that are making more of a direct impact, you know, the Floyds, the uh, the Florence's, those, those, and Matthews, we, you know, most are, and most of the freshwater drownings that we have are vehicular related. Uh, it's, it's people driving in areas they shouldn't be, not realizing that the, the road is being undermined or is washed away altogether and, and they have uh, crashed through the road and get pushed off, off the roadway. Uh, I think if we go back to 1970 and we take out Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Katrina had, you know, hundreds of storm surge related uh, flood fatalities. Um, but the freshwater flooding since 1970, I, I believe, is the, one of the more significant hazards posed by a hurricane with deaths in the nation. Did that answer your question there, Ricky? Yes, it did. Uh, just a comment. You know, the recent heavy rains we've had here in Fender County, I know we've had a lot of roads washed out you know up under the edges of the lanes and all so with starting out the season like this it's going to be a something to really uh keep an eye on thank you yes good point there ricky thanks for the comment 